Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Bounce, 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 bounce. Don't, Don't do me like that. that. Bling. Don't, Don't do, do me, me like, like that. Bling. What if I love you, baby? Don't, Don't do me like that. that. <laughs> Good one. Nice. High fives. <laughs> What's up, everybody? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jimmy Wong. How's it? I'm your other host, Josh Lee Kwai. Welcome to a very special episode of the podcast. You know, I think everybody who's played Commander for any amount of time has had this situation come up, right? Yes. You get this spark of inspiration for a deck. You see a commander or you see a few cards that aren't commanders and you think I'm going to build a deck around this thing and you take all this time and effort and you acquire the cards and you put it all together and you play it and... It's not what you were hoping for. In fact, it actually is everything you don't want to do sometimes. You hate it. You dislike it. And it's a bad feeling. Yeah. It really is a bad feeling. You spend all that time and effort and then you dislike playing the deck you realize yeah. sometimes it takes a little while because of cognitive dissonance but you figure out yep. i really actually don't like this deck so today we're going to do something interesting we are going to talk to a bunch of members of our team here at the command zone Throw about every day yep about decks they built but ended up uh hating um and we're hoping that we can kind of learn what the warning signs are so that maybe we can avoid doing that in yeah. the future. Yeah, and it's great. Everyone has really unique stories and perspectives, and actually some of them caught me by surprise because I only have our own experiences to base it off of, so it's great to hear from everyone. But before we get into it, we've got to talk about our sponsors, our brand new sponsor, channelfireball.com slash command, or you can just use the code command at checkout. Well, we've been talking about this a lot, but it is still very exciting. They have officially launched their marketplace, which is going to be the place to go if you want to buy any magic singles or product. Basically, you want a card, you can get at the marketplace for a great price. Yeah, marketplaces in general drive prices down because there's a lot of different vendors offering their products and services on that mm -hmm. marketplace. So they have to compete with each other, which makes the prices get lower. All also, it means the inventory is very, very high because there's not just one seller. There are tons of sellers there. I mean, I think a lot of people are familiar with online marketplaces. Now, the, the yeah. different thing about Channel Fireball, and we've been talking about this over and over, but I love this about it. They're vetting their vendors. They're checking to make sure they have business licenses, that they are up to a high quality standard. So they're mm -hmm. not just letting anybody sell stuff on their site. Yeah. And a lot of those places selling are actually LGSs. So, you know, if you can't make it out to your local game store, this is a great way to still support that economy, that very vital part of what makes magic awesome are these stores that you know they their livelihood depends on us buying cards and stuff off of them so you're gonna get those cards anyway just use code command at checkout or go to channelfireball.com slash command and it's marketplace madness they have daily giveaways for every single game that they sell stuff for and at the end of the month oh their grand prizes are sweet yeah so for the very first month of the marketplace which is all of october every single day they're giving away stuff for people that use the marketplace every ten dollars you spend will enter you to win cool. and then at the end of that they are giving away some really big prizes the grand prizes so you can win things like an unlimited Black Lotus, Ooh. a first edition, edition Charizard, an alpha welcome to the, uh, to Wrath Box from uh, Flesh and Blood, Flesh and Blood yeah, even yeah. more stuff um, available as grand prizes. So it's it's just definitely for this month, 100% the best place to buy stuff because yeah. as far as I know, no place else is saying like, hey, if you buy stuff here, <laughs> you also have a chance to win a Black Lotus. Yeah, or any of the other giveaways that they're doing for all of the games that they sell for. And like we mentioned, they do Pokemon, Flesh and Blood, and Magic. So lots of different options there. So make sure you check it out, channelfireball.com slash command or just promo code command when you check out. Uh, and we also have to shout out Ultra Pro, Woo! our other sponsor. You know, if you get an unlimited Black Lotus, if you win one some way, you know, I would trust Ultra Pro products to protect that thing. And uh, there's very few products I would trust in that instance but we've been using Ultra Pro Jimmy and I mm -hmm. on our own collections for years and years and years we have big collections we want to keep our cards in pristine condition just like everybody out there Ultra Pro is the best product to protect your game pieces and not just that they also make the sharpest looking coolest products like they have their play mats are so good yeah their play mats are great they have awesome deck boxes I love that mythic collection with the really classic yep. stitching and everything like that so it's not just high quality it also looks really cool when you set it down on the table it makes the opponents go ooh yeah, and Ultra Pro also, they make those special cases for those very expensive cards yeah. that are like clear plastic and will hold it in pristine condition.
position forever. So Ultra Pro, they've been doing this. They've been in the game for a long, long time, and they're who you can trust. Okay, uh, and the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. We really appreciate all our patrons. They help keep uh, all of our content flowing. They get to see things like Game Night Snacks returns earlier than anybody else. And another perk is patrons get... Uh, we, we choose one randomly every single uh, podcast episode to shout out, and this episode is dedicated to... David, David Axford. Axford. David, you rock. And one last thing. We Real quick. New Kickstarter right now for the Token Series 2. Make sure you check it out. It ends at the end of the month. Once it is done, you cannot get it anymore. These are some of the most used tokens with our awesome faces emblazoned on them as iconic creatures. And if you're a Game Nights fan, you're going to know exactly where these references are from. We also have a cool play mat, two-sided, that comes along with this at certain tiers. So just make sure you check that out. All the links are going to be in the show more box below the video. Yeah, limited edition order now. Okay, let's go into the main topic here. Sorry, that part took just a little bit longer than we wanted <laughs> to. A lot to talk about these days. All right, main topic though. Decks we built, but hated yeah so our team at the command zone has gotten pretty large i think we just brought on or are bringing on on monday we have one person joining um that is like our 17th or 18th wow. member of the team almost maybe 20 we're almost yeah. out of our teens <laughs> Crazy. Uh, the great thing is that like the vast majority of them are commander players mm -hmm. so we thought this episode would be a great way to sort of tap into that group knowledge um learn about the decks that these that everybody here has built and hated and all It'll help us maybe identify, steer clear of like, you know, doing that in the future. So I definitely don't want to acquire a bunch of cards that then I don't yeah. use. And I've done this too recently. Yeah. I've been playing for eight years now and I've still make this mistake. And this is great advice if you know someone that's just getting into the game. You're about to give them a pre-con. Maybe they can avoid some of the common pitfalls. And we also thought this would be a cool way to sort of uh, hopefully introduce some of our new team, team members and our old team members yeah. to you um, here by getting to hear from them. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to talk to individual team members just for a few minutes about, you know, the deck they've identified. Some some people have, this has happened more than once, myself, Jimmy, yeah, yeah. Um, but we're just going to talk about one of their decks to kind of get an idea for what types of decks maybe um, are warning signs for stuff you might build and end up hating. So Jimmy and I are going to individually interview... Uh, not all our members of the team, but a lot of them. A lot of them, yeah. Yeah. All, all right. right. So I think we're going to start up with uh, the person I think whose idea this topic was originally. Yeah. Which is Jake Boss. Ooh, let's take it away. All right. Do you want to introduce yourself to everyone? Hey, everybody. I'm Jake. Uh, I'm post production supervisor on Game Nights, and uh, yeah, we do a lot of editing on Game Nights. <laughs> yeah, post production soup editing also has directed some episodes of Game Nights. That's right. That's important. Yeah, Jake does a lot around here. Um, Jake, how long have you been a member of the Command Zone team? Uh, I started in July of 2019 and moved down here from Portland, and it was the best decision I ever made. So a little over two years. A little over two years, wow, and it's crazy. gone really well, yeah. <laughs> we agree. It has gone very, very well. Jake, how would you describe yourself as a Magic player? As a Magic player, uh, I'm definitely more of a Johnny uh, combo type. I like to see something cool happen, and I don't really care who wins. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to do things that are like possibility storm that chaos up the game or anything. But you uh, like like to have an idea that maybe puts together a combination of cards that people haven't seen before, that kind of that kind of Johnny? For sure. Uh, sometimes I'll reach for a more obscure commander, but what I like to do is take a good commander and do something a little bit more interesting, add a bit of English to the strategy that's pretty accepted. Cool, 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 cool. All right, so let's, uh, let's go over the deck that you built that you ended up hating. Yeah, so a really good example of putting your own English on a common strategy is Enchantress. Uh, the commander I chose for this deck is Omnath, Locus of Creation. So, oh, so you built Enchantress, Omnath, which... Enchantress itself is not necessarily a strategy we haven't seen, but you usually don't see Omnath at the at the head of that strategy. Yeah, uh, I didn't want to go five color because I felt like that's that's a thing. Everything, you yeah. know, you, <laughs> that's not fair. Goal as an artist, Enchantress, I've seen that. Yeah, well, as I'm an not artist, anymore. you want limitations. That's where creativity happens. Right. So you just take out black, and now you're an artist. Oh, so it's kind of like Enchantress, but I get red. But I get red, yes. Um, and there are fun enchantments like Fevered Visions and there are Right of the Raging oh, Storm. Yeah. yeah, there's awesome enchantments in red. Um, but it kind of became, if you give it mouse, a cookie for me. So uh, yeah, yeah, let's talk about why you ended up disliking it. Because honestly, sounds fun. So you play an enchantment, you draw a card. Yeah. Why not do that more? So there's cards like Teferi's Edge of Insight, which will double up your card draw. Uh, you play more Enchantress cards, and you just end up playing an enchantment, drawing eight cards. Play another enchantment, draw 16 cards. Um, and then Omnath kind of wants it to be a lands deck, too. So you've got all these things. Why don't you just play the lands and get the value and all this stuff? And it just got away from me because if you're drawing all these cards, why not win with Approach of the Second Sun? 
that's not fun to win with because it just says you win the game on it. Game's over for everybody. It's not really a good time. Or you win with opalescence, but that's kind of a glass cannon strategy that can just wreck you. Or you deck yourself and win with Lab Man or Thassa's Oracle. It's just not a clean way to win the game that leaves everybody satisfied. And they have to watch me spinning my wheels a ton before they're able to do anything. Yeah, I'd say it happens with a lot of Enchantress decks. If what you're describing sounds like kind of like, I spin my wheels a lot yeah. and I don't win. Yeah, what, something that you say to us all the time is, is the juice worth the squeeze? And if I'm drawing, you know, 93 cards just to potentially get a win, it's not worth it to me. So, so yeah, do you remember Do you remember the moment where you decided, like, I don't like this? Yes, uh, actually, we were playing at a party one time and there was a game that uh, I really wanted to get in with Post Malone. Oh. And I knew his pod was wrapping up, so I'm like, I got to get out of this pod. <laughs> <So> <laughs> you're like, I cannot win. I decided to draw my entire deck. And when you're able to decide this game is over, oh, I'm just, just going to mill myself. <laughs> uh, like, I'm going to draw 60 cards this turn. Well, guess I lose. Bye, guys. That deck probably isn't that great. <laughs> so, so you did that and that made you decide like, oh, I don't really want to, I don't need this deck anymore. What happened? to the deck like do you salve it still have it it turned into a kineos and Tiro tokens deck that i played on extra turns it's a hidden brutaclad commander deck oh, now okay. so it has some of the same elements but it's a totally different deck exactly the kineos and Tiro, uh they love drawing cards and they love playing extra lands so there's a little bit of those remnants in there and then all but it's the not enchantress enchant anymore no the enchantress side turned into sithis harvest hand which is much more limited in selesnia so you get to be a real artist <laughs> you get to be a real artist. Yeah, you're constrained by limitations. It's important. It's very important. All right, we are joined by the one and only Ashlyn Rose. Ashlyn, say hello and uh, let everyone what you know what you do here at the Command Zone and how long you've been here for. What's up, everyone? Yeah. It's good to be back. Um, <laughs> I uh, What do I do? I'm an editor here at the Command Zone. Mm -hmm. I also help with a lot of the production for our special projects, like yeah. the D&D uh, the &D thing you may have saw before the... Uh, the Silver Quill Pro. Promos, yeah. yeah, all that good stuff. How uh, long have you been here for? Oh my gosh, uh, four years now, I think. Yeah. It's been a while. It has been. I've been very lucky to be your friend for all that time and yeah. to get to work with you. So it's been a blessing. Now, Ashlyn, how would you describe yourself? Now, people watching probably will know, but how would you <laughs> describe yourself as a Magic player? What makes you happy? All right, first... In the chat, I want to see in the chat, like we're streaming, hey, <laughs> uh, in the comments, I would love to see what you all think uh, I am as a player, but I would consider myself a big, splashy player. I love big creatures, mm -hmm. big, cool spells. Uh, I don't really care about the, the value long term. I just I just want to do something cool. Right. Eldrazi is the word that comes to mind <laughs> yeah. for me. So big, scary creatures and all that stuff is a little bit more on the Timmy side, less on the, the value spiky side, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I can definitely identify with that. That. All right, so what is a deck that you built in the past but have ended up disliking or hating or whatever word you want to put for it? Yeah, so I still have the deck, actually, but my, ah. the deck I've built that has definitely gathered some dust on the shelf these days is going to be a Robo Roar of the Wild oh, World. Kitty Tribal, then. Kitty Tribal, right. yes. So why did you build the deck originally? Uh, because I love kitties. I have two kitties of my own. They are on stream all the time, showing their butts and wanting scritches. <laughs> but uh, the deck itself, the way I built it with the Kitty Tribal, it's super good. It gets like really big kitties, really buff, swole kitties, but it's so much math. Oh, okay. So much math. Right. So it's a lot of brain power. When Now, when you first built the deck, when did you realize, like, you know what? I don't actually like playing this deck. Way too late in the game. Like, I, <laughs> I completely <laughs> built the deck. I, I've been playing it, like, four or five times. And, like, I realized maybe the fourth game when everyone's kind of just, like, sitting there twiddling their thumbs while I'm like, okay, I've almost got the math here. Right. That, like, yeah, this was not for me. Right. But the cats are super cute. So is that what you drew you to the deck originally? It was just the sort of the theme of it all? Yeah. I mean, I love doing theme decks as well. Themed Eldrazi, mm -hmm. themed ninjas, kitties. So I definitely wanted to go with kitty power. And it's powerful. But, oh my gosh, so much math. Would you, do you think you'd ever, like, retool the deck into something that is more akin to your play style and involves a little less mental work? I think it's very possible. I think that there's definitely been new things printed since I built this. It was a long time ago. Right, when the precon came out, Exactly, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, So I think there's there's definitely a chance for that to happen. Arabo still kind of plays into that with, like, the plus 
plus plus the imminence ability on Arabo, yeah. but there's still a chance, I think, for for Kitty to come back. Now, when you did play this deck, is it a deck that won, or is it? Did you even find it didn't win because maybe you got frustrated with all the stuff you had to think about when you're attacking and stuff? It definitely won. Okay. Yeah. It, it was one of the decks that kind of hung back for a while, and then at the end, it's like, oh, all my cats get plus plus, and uh, right. yeah, and they punch trample, the face. and they're huge, and all that stuff. Um, now, do you have, you know, do you think that this is a deck that you will still bring out, or is it just going to sit in the corner with dust? Uh, I think it's going to sit in the corner for a while yeah. until I feel like I want to buff it up. Right now, I'm just distracted with all the other goodies like my Essex deck and uh, yes, that's right, <laughs> those other fun splashy things. But eventually. So that's cool. I actually think you're actually one of the more unique cases because most people built decks that was like really early on in their career for Magic and they didn't really know what they were doing, put too much other stuff in that didn't work. But this is a deck that works, is powerful, but just actually ends up being too much work at the table. And I can totally see why that makes sense because after like three or four games, you're just kind of wiped. You don't want to play a deck that's going to require you to think a lot. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know it's a problem when other people are helping you do the math just to hurry the turn along. <laughs> They're like, hold on, hold on. Maybe if you did that... Yeah. Yeah. then attack did that happen a bunch too yeah exactly they're oh, like okay baby. no you're actually getting plus this plus this and you're like okay i'm so sorry <laughs> let's just, right. we're just i'm gonna play a different deck now would this be a deck that you would you wouldn't lend this deck to a new player then would you oh, even though it's a really not. basic deck in a lot of ways it's just creature based strategy but it's not something you'd be like hey check it out no totally not because not only are you putting like plus one plus one counters on cards you also have the whole like until end of turn this gets plus uh, plus yeah. and, and that's just, trample and all those things yeah yeah it's too much to keep track of well that makes makes a lot of sense though it's a really unique case the fact that you still have the deck also i think almost everyone else has disassembled the decks that they don't like anymore so that's really great yeah all right well thank you so much ashlyn for telling us about arabo <laughs> roar of the world i i think it's roar of the wild too i think it's probably because i'm thinking about zelda uh, you know what i, I totally think that's <laughs> all right well thanks ashlyn it was good to hear about the deck yeah thanks for having me Okay, we are here with, well, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, guys. I'm Murph. Um, you probably have seen me around. So I edit game nights, extra turns, uh, been on some gameplay shows, been on the podcast before. You've definitely been in a lot of the ads and stuff. Yeah. I'm sure you know who Murph is. Um, but, yeah, it's good for you to explain that you what you do here. Uh, Murph is primarily a game nights editor and also kind of post-production supervisor on extra turns yep. recently. So he's in charge of that. Murph, how long have you worked for us? Um, a little over three years now. Wow, over yeah. three years. So <laughs> definitely a long time member of the team. Murph, how would you describe yourself as a magic player? Um, I'm a magic player that likes building things unique. We did an episode a while ago now where we talked about the most unique commanders and decks and stuff like that. So I like to think out of the box a little bit, try to be a little bit cute with the stuff that I try to build. Um, I don't know. You're yeah. a little bit of a magic hipster? A little bit of a magic hipster. What was the um, commander you played on the most recent episode of Extra Turns? Uh, at this point... Was it Ramsey's? Oh, Ramsey's Overdark, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we're going to put that on screen because probably pro most of you probably don't know what that card is. Yeah. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about today. We are talking about what is a deck that you built at some point uh, and then ended up disliking. Yeah. So... The deck that I built and ended up disliking was Asmira Holy Avenger. All right, read that card because I have no idea what it does. <laughs> <laughs> this true hipster. Yeah, so it is a four mana creature, two green and a white, two three, uh, I believe it's an angel, it says summon legend on it. Probably Fl got it ratted. <laughs> yeah. Flying at the end of each turn, put a plus one plus one counter on Asmira Holy Avenger for each creature put into your graveyard from play that turn. So that happens at the end of each turn. If something on your board died, Asmira gets a plus one, plus one counter, but only at end of turn. But for each of the creatures. For that each died. of the creatures. So that if died, you yeah. could somehow sack like 10 creatures, then at the end of that turn, Asmira would get plus 10, plus 10. Yeah. So I thought that that would be kind of cool that, well, let's try to do an aristocrat strategy in green and white, because that's not something that you really see super often. Okay, so we already know the outcome. What didn't you like about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, now you know why you never see green, white, aristocrat stack. There's a reason nobody builds it. And I'm assuming that just because I said that, it's going to be a challenge to everybody out there to try <laughs> to build a green, white, aristocrat stack. Uh, yeah, but the problem with it is the text on it, it only triggers on end step. Uh, so it's really clunky because when it gets to your turn, uh, you can't really like sack a bunch of stuff and attack with it. You have to wait a whole turn rotation for it to actually do anything. So oftentimes it'll just sit there, spin its wheels a little bit and not really do anything. Uh, but there are a couple pieces in there that are incredibly powerful, like Lifeline. But the problem with it is that at the end of 
each player's turn, that's when you get the plus one, plus one counters. So on your turn, if you do a bunch of cool stuff, you'll mm -hmm. get a ton of plus one, plus one counters on his mirror, but only at end of turn. So you can't attack or do anything really cool with it that turn. So you kind of got to play as Mira, do this thing, and then wait a whole rotation. Yeah. If you do a bunch of scary stuff, people are going to be like, yeah, yo, kill that thing. Yeah, people are just going to try to kill me, kill the thing, shut right. down my engines, whatnot, what have you. Do you remember the moment that you kind of discovered? Was it the very first time you played the deck, or did you try it a number of times? It was absolutely the very first time that I played the deck. I played the deck. I got so excited to build the deck. I even got an OG Duel, a Savannah for it, because oh, wow. I was sure that it was going to work. So, uh, yeah, you put I goldfished it on tapped out, and was like this is gonna work and then i played it in person against my brother and did not work it just flopped hard did absolutely nothing and so i thought okay well it just had a bad showing we'll try again played a couple more games with it still did nothing i thought okay well maybe i can go back get another more few more pieces did another card order swapped out about 15 cards oh so you tried to optimize it oh yeah. i tried to optimize it i was like <laughs> super super intent on getting this thing to work um how but, long did you say that you tried to make it work before you decided like this is not going to work uh like a month and a half or so uh, eventually i realized that because i did put some good pieces in it uh but those good pieces would either just make the deck ridiculously powerful if I drew that one or two pieces, or the deck would do nothing. So it didn't really have a home at any table was the problem. Right, so it was either too powerful, it felt like, or just didn't do anything? Exactly. So let me ask you, I mean, I guess we know because it looks like it's kind of sitting there, yeah. but what happened to the deck? Uh, the deck is still there. Uh, my intention was to pull it apart, but I don't really need the pieces for anything. So it's just kind of been sitting there for like a year, year and a half or something, and I haven't really done anything with it. But you don't play it, you don't like bring it to Commander nope, Knight? it's not in my not deck box, it's just sitting off to the side with my collection of cards. It's, it exists. Well, I'm sorry, Rip Asmira. Rip Asmira. Everyone say hello to Jamie. Jamie, you're brand new here at the Command Zone, so you want to introduce yourself and tell everyone what you do. Sure. Hello, everyone. I am Jamie. I am a new staff writer here. This is my fourth week, I believe. Wow. Uh, so what I do here is, you know, I write a lot of the mid-roll ads that you guys see, and then just sort of anything else that has a script that might be forthcoming, I'll be working on that as well. Have you enjoyed your time thus far? It's been a hot, fast month so far. I have, yes. It has been a roller coaster in the best <laughs> possible way. Uh, but no, just a great team to be a part of. Super excited to be here. Yeah, and we're glad to have you. So, Jamie, how would you describe yourself as a magic player? What sort of are your favorite things to do or play the game? My favorite kind of game is the game where everyone gets to do what they want to do. Uh -huh. uh, but then I win. <laughs> Uh, but no, as long as everyone gets to have fun, uh -huh. no one's just completely out of the game. I'm going to have a good time. I definitely just sort of feed off the energy of other people having I a see. good time. But uh, yeah, as far as my own decks, I just like to do things that have a pretty gradual value engine. Not a ton of building toward an infinite combo, mm -hmm. but just a steady value engine that gets to do something cool and ideally unique from a lot of other decks out there. Okay. So do you ever feel bad when you have to like team up on someone and have them have less fun? It depends how far ahead they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if, if it's taking down an arch enemy, like, yes, please, I'm all in on that. Okay. But if it's, a, if it's a situation where we're just worried someone might become a threat. Ah, uh, you're not going to be, be a proactive on that side. Exactly. Good to know. That's great. Okay, so let us know, what is a deck that you built but dislike or hate? Yes, I built Grothama All Devouring. Ooh, I've always wanted to build this deck. Well, you would do it better than I did it three years ago. <laughs> okay, I'm why sure. is that? Uh, I just... I saw the card and instantly just sort of fell in love with the idea of all the weird things that it can do. Uh, okay. Just a completely different, sort of unintuitive immediately mechanic with all the fighting. Right. Uh, and just thought, oh, there's got to be some crazy things that you can do with this. You said meme when we were talking about it downstairs, like a meme, right? Yeah. It's just, there are a lot of meme strategies you can do. So you can do things where you get value from it fighting your creatures. Mm -hmm. There are things you can do where you get value from it fighting your opponent's creatures if for some reason they do that. Yeah. And you like unique decks like you said so this had an opportunity for you to make that yeah exactly the problem came up with uh me trying to make it unique in too many different directions at once ah i see yep 
over sort of spreading yourself too thin across a lot of strategies. Exactly. I would say that this deck had at minimum 10 different strategies that it was trying to pull off. <laughs> wow. Each of which involved two or three specific cards that it had very few ways to find. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, you just sort of hoped that you drew into one of the memes. And uh, you would also get the other parts of the meme to make it full. Exactly. And then, of course, even if it were to have cobbled together one of these memes, it probably wouldn't win. Oh, uh, <laughs> So it really was just kind of like a deck that had a lot of cool ideas, but not that finishing power. And did you find that you had fun, like you said, and win the game with it ever? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was fun, maybe for the moments of physically drawing a card, thinking, oh, what if this is the card that I need? I see. And then it never was. I see, yeah. So, yeah, it was, I will say it was a very fun deck to build. Mm -hmm. It was a fun deck to come up with the cards for, think of all the interactions that Grothama can have. I see. But it just didn't come together into something that executed in a fun way. Yeah, yeah. That research part, I mean, I love building decks too, but when you actually got down to shuffling it, it just didn't come together, I guess. Yeah. If I think that if I were to build it now, again, and just focus in on two or three of those memes mm -hmm. and actually commit to making them work, it could be something that still probably wouldn't be the most competitive deck because that's never what it was trying to do but at least something that would be fun to pilot more consistent yeah mm -hmm. and green has tons of creature tutors and ramp and all that stuff so did you at least have some of those components in the original version i definitely had a ramp though it was admittedly uh not the best man uh, the, not the best ramp seat that was available then i see certainly not the best ramp suite that would be available now <laughs> uh but as for card draw it was there a little bit. As for tutors, maybe a little maybe, bit. Yeah. But uh, given how much the deck relied on getting specific cards, it did not have enough ways to find them. Yeah. And where is the deck now? I'm assuming not put together. No, the deck is fully disassembled. It went first. It went into a pile, and then okay. it went into a binder. And now a few cards have made it into other decks I've built since that have green in them. And most are just sitting in some pages of a binder, waiting for me to find another mono green commander. <laughs> and then I'll only have to get maybe a third to half of the cards because half of them I have already. There you go. That sounds like the normal course for a lot of decks' lifespans. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks, Jane, for sharing. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to introduce yourself to the audience out here? Sure. Hey, uh, my name is Arthur Meadowcroft. I'm an editor on the Command Zone podcast. I've been editing for about a year. I never thought I'd be here, but I'm thrilled to be here and I'm learning so much every day and having a great time. It's almost exactly a, a year, right? Was it Yeah. Was it yeah. November of last year that November 1st I started. Yeah. yeah. So, so almost cool. exactly a year. Yes, Arthur, uh, you're going to get the weird experience of editing yourself on this episode, which most people do not like. You're going to tell that thing to me that everybody says, which is like, I can't stand listening to my own voice. Yeah. Yeah. Trust me, you do get used to it. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know from experience. Arthur, what, uh, how would you describe yourself as a magic player? What kind of magic player are you? Uh, I'd say I'm a bit of a Timmy. I really like to cast big, splashy spells. And if I make it to the late game, then I'm having a good time. So you want to cast something that everybody goes, whoa, holy crap. Uh, yeah, I like to go, well, holy crap. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about a deck that you once built but found out that you hated. Sure. So I'd like to talk about my Morophon the Boundless deck. Okay. Uh, I built it as an elf tribal, kind of like a bounce house. I tried to get out Cloudstone Curio uh, and then cast low cost elves that would essentially cost zero because the Wooburg cost would be less. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because Morphon would reduce it by green, so they cost zero. Yeah. That sounds like a cool idea. Why yeah. didn't you like it? So the high end of the deck was that. I'd have out like a Guardian project or a Zendikar Resurgent, and then I'd Drawing just be time. just spinning wheels. And it was either that, or I would be sandbagging my favorite elf cards and casting them all on one turn. And so it was either go through my whole deck or wait for the ideal turn to pop off. So it either didn't do anything or it did the spinning the wheels thing. Did exactly. also, it sounds like maybe you had that problem where it spun its wheels and and had trouble like figuring out how I was going to win. Is that a thing? No. So the the trajectory the deck went in is that I ended up uh, winning with Thassa's Oracle. Um, uh -huh. And so, yeah, pretty much it was kind of just uh, a trajectory that led to me adding in tutors, doing Thassa's Oracle and winning. And so the the redeeming arc of this, though, is I still have the deck. I've I took it apart. I did hate it for that reason, but I didn't want to give up on it. And well, so the reason you hate it is it was just going to, too much towards CEDH? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you still have it? Yeah. 
So uh, I'm trying to make it uh, with the For Forgotten Realms coming out. There were a yeah. lot of new Wooburg elves and that made me really happy because I wanted to revisit it and try to stray away from that win the game with Thassa's Oracle. Yeah. So now you're trying to actually use the elves from the other colors and just Definitely. get the value of the mana from more fun? Definitely. Font? Yeah, like Shaman of the Pack isn't from Forgotten Realms, but that's a really fun one. Drizzt Orden is really right. cool because that can cost three colorless now. Oh, that's... Or five, three colorless, yeah. So you want to make it into sort of more of a true elf deck. Are you like, you're just working on the deck right now? It's not, it's not ready to play or have you played it? Yeah, I played it. Uh, it's kind of funny because you can add in so many different legendary elves that people are confused. Like Craig one time walked by and saw me playing and was just trying to figure out because I had Azuri Renegade leader out. I had Salvala uh, Explorer like, Who Who's at the head of this deck? <laughs> What's this doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so That's yeah. cool. So you were able to pivot off of sort of that path that was making you dislike the deck and sort of turn it into something that you like a little more now. Yeah, and that's one reason I love Commander is that there's an avenue for everyone no matter who, who the commander is. Like you can dislike it and then think about what you like as a player and for me it's just big cards so i add in more the high cost elves and i'm less concerned with just trying to spin out all these low cost elves and instead add in the big fun ones like uh, trist orden for example very cool yeah what's up this is mr jordan pridgen jordan introduce yourself to the audience tell them what you do here at the command zone hi everybody i am a uh, writer and ad producer here on the channel i make a lot of i write and make a lot of the like mid-roll ads that mm -hmm. you see and i also write some of the extra content like the uh strixhaven commercials and yeah. the afr like little classes playing Dungeons and Dragons sketch and stuff. Yeah, some of our finest work, by the way. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Uh, so how long have you been here at the Command Zone? I've been here about a year now. Wow, that's crazy. Time flies. Okay, Jordan, how would you describe yourself as a magic player when it comes to it? I am definitely a Johnny. Like, I, I like uh -huh. having, like, complicated decks, and, and I like them having, like, systems that I have to understand and work through and, and like, do that. But I also really like the sort of threat answer interaction of magic. Uh, like, okay. I really like having to fight my way through the other people's board state and play a lot of interaction, a lot of that sort of thing. Uh, I like to earn my wins. So you're kind of like the threat assessment police almost. Do you find yourself <laughs> convincing other people like, hey, you got to take care of that thing first? I definitely do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's a lot of times where I'm like, why am I the only one who's dealing with anything? Yeah, I feel that way quite often too, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when it comes to it, then what is a deck that you built but ended up just disliking, hating, or whatever? So I built Kadena Slinking Sorcerer. Slinking Sorcerer. Yeah. As the prof put it when he played it, yeah. And I, I was excited to build the deck because I was there at like Gen Con when they like announced like oh you know the this is morph is gonna be one of the themes uh, for the next okay. one okay yeah and I was like that's so cool think of all the like different things you can do and um I I got the pre-con and then I upgraded it and I put it together like kind of how I wanted it to be and mm -hmm. I like played it once and uh I hated it <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you only played it once and you hated it? Yeah, and I Did bet if I had, like, kept playing it more times, I, I would have, like, started to like it more. But, like, I just did not want to play it anymore. Bad first impression. Well, and here's why. Because, you know, you play the deck and you're playing all these morph cards face down. And I would uh -huh. have, like, six or seven face down cards. And someone would play something and be like, any response? And I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> Give me a sec. <laughs> Hold on. And you had to look at each card. And I have to check all the cards that were down. And I, look, I, I just know myself. And I mm -hmm. like assessing the board state. I like figuring out what's going on there. Yeah. But, like, I cannot remember this information that is face down. Right. You know, especially when there's, like, all that stuff. Even little details like, oh, how much does it cost to like flip wheel bender yep. and things like that? Sure, that's on the simpler side of things. But when there's like six to eight of those on the board that you're trying to deal with all the time, it was just like a nightmare. Yeah, so a lot of information retention. And again, you're someone that does like to be that person responding to the threats and dealing with all those threats. But you you already have enough information in your hand that e knowing all that stuff hidden as well. Exactly, because you're still trying to assess what everyone else has on their board yeah. and you have your cards in your hand. And I thought it would be cool to be like, ah, I have all these tricky little onboard trap cards. Right. But what I found out is like it was just like decision paralysis for me all the time. Oh, are you a Yu-Gi-Oh fan? Uh, I used to like the show. I've never played the game. Well, I guess not because you couldn't play the trap card version of it. It wasn't appealing to you, right? It's true. It would have been a problem. Also, when I was a kid, I was like very loyal to the idea of Magic the Gathering. Uh, okay. um, and Yu-Gi-Oh felt like it was competing with Magic the Gathering. <laughs> so you were like, no, so Yu-Gi-Oh. Like, no, I'm on Magic side. You're a Magic purist, huh? Yeah. So what happened to the Kadena deck? Is it still around? I it's still... 
I still have it oh, okay. somewhere. Um, I'm not sure where because I, I I like didn't double sleeve it. I've never gone back and like really like rearrange the cards. And it also is a case where Kadena's like a specialty enough commander that I didn't need to like pull the cards out. For yeah, other yeah. Stuff. There's so much stuff already built in there that the deck was pretty because you didn't do a huge upgrade to it. I'm assuming no. But I put in a lot of the cards like that that one card that's like something key that makes it cost less to morph stuff. Right, right. And a bunch of like solid morph and mega morph creatures and things like that. Besides that, it wasn't like loaded with my cyclonic rifts and mana crypts or anything. Like All that. you're like yeah, yeah. So it was just like a slight upgrade. So it didn't feel that bad then. Did you like feel pangs of guilt when you're like okay you got to go kadena i don't like you anymore you know it just i i i, I kind of pushed it aside because i was like, you make me feel like an idiot <laughs> <laughs> i feel bad at magic when i'm playing you right and you want to feel good at magic because again you are mr threat assessment so yes. that makes a lot of sense okay well jordan thanks for sharing very much appreciated and good note to take uh don't build any more morph decks because <laughs> there's just too much to keep track of look i know a lot of people love kadena just wasn't for me yeah yeah, yeah. and that's how it goes all right thanks jordan all right, and now we're here with Shauna. Shauna, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Shauna Gillis. I'm a recent uh, junior video editor on the Command Zone here, and uh, it's going pretty well so far. Yeah, you've only been with us for, well, it's not even months. It's weeks at this point, it's right? It's two weeks, Josh. It's yeah. two weeks. <laughs> two weeks. Welcome to the team. Sure, sure. Uh, we're, we're excited to have you. Shauna, how would you describe yourself as a Magic player? So my playgroup mainly plays CDH, so that I know that's not the case here as much, yep. but um, within that kind of faction i'm mostly a control player so you're a control cedh player pretty much yeah cool 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 <laughs> that's not how we play here so now i'm scared <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's fine. totally fine it'll be fine yeah. i have a teferi chain veil deck so you know it should be okay yeah. right i yeah. can play that against you um Let's talk about a deck that you once built that you ended up disliking. This is actually going to be really interesting because you're right. Most of the people we've talked to are not CEDH players. Sure. So, um, yeah, let's. what is a deck you built once and then as you played it, you found out you did not like playing it? Sure. So, like Jimmy, I just played against Jimmy's Paco Haldan deck and I actually built one of those for CEDH. And the one for CEDH is pretty Voltron heavy. He mostly presents a threat early and then he's your main win condition. Um, you do have like a season's past combo that you can kind of win through, give yourself infinite mana, infinite turns. Um, but he he mainly he wins through combat damage. And so You mean Jimmy's deck. So um no. Uh, so Jimmy's deck oh, wins. So, so Paco wins through combat damage. Yeah, I would say that Paco Haldan in general wins through combat damage. Okay. I have I don't think I've ever seen a deck or I would build the deck where he isn't your main win condition. Uh -huh. um, and essentially what the CDH version of the deck does is get, is uses Seasons Past and like a five mana extra turn spell, Temporal Chest Pass, like to give yourself extra turns, infinite mana. So this is a known deck that you built. It's, um so there's a pretty well-known CDH database that has a good list of yeah. everything that the database approves and it's on there. So right. it's, I wouldn't say it's common. I've seen it twice in my play group, including mine, but um, it does pretty well just because the deck is so resilient. And if you keep, essentially, you can do nothing else but keep playing Paco and right. continuously present a threat. A threat. Right. Yeah. Okay. So what made you dislike it? So the main thing that Paco does is it uses Haldan to steal advantage from other decks. So every time he attacks, you exile a card off of everyone's library, right. and you can essentially use that to, with Haldan, build a second hand for yourself. So in CDH, you're going to see a lot of one mana spell removals, one mana counter, stuff like that. And it essentially just gives you an a, a second hand that you can use to... That sounds good, though. It does sound good, but it's just the kind of... I learned, um, obviously, that was my incentive for building the deck, but I learned that stealing advantage from other players does not feel good, especially if um, a lot of times in CDH decks, people will run... 29 30 lands right on the right on the curve so if you so, just happen to exile off a couple lands they can just be mana screwed if someone's waiting on the land and they're waiting for one of their 29 lands they're just they're just screwed for the rest of the game okay well this is really interesting to me because i think we have a view of cdh players as like that would as like only trying to win and not so much worrying about like if your opponents are having fun since the goal of that format seems to be to win but that's, that's evidently not true and i'm definitely, i have a misconception definitely not true um I, it, it is a little bit more of there's an understanding that the point is to win it's a little more hardcore but if you brought goto to the table he just slaps hand helm of the host down and wins usually presents a win turn two turn three right that is not fun so this is a general feeling in my play group right the most fun cdh game is one that is very interaction heavy and it lasts 
six to eight turns. Nobody wants to sit down, shuffle up, and then play two turns and then redo it. So that you're so, spending more time shuffling than playing? Exactly, exactly. So, um, Paco... So, so, so Paco and Haldan, you disliked it because it was too mean, kind of? I would say so. It's, it's so disruptive to the point where you can essentially put yourself into a three-player game because you either take this guy's lands and he's not, he's playing, not, playing. The, not playing the game. And three-person games, as I'm sure you know from casual, it just builds like this really weird dynamic that um, can easily can make someone else. So it, it can be really, uh, it can go well, but generally I just kind of learned that I like those toolboxy decks where I build my advantage by myself. I'm not taking from other players. I can essentially just play solitaire by myself and... It's kind build, of who gets there first and you're not my own win, stopping yeah. them as much. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. So what happened to the Paco Haldon deck? Do you still have it? No, I ended up taking it apart um, just because... So you committed to, I do not like this and I'm just done with it. Yeah, no, um, I'm definitely... I definitely like the controlling types. Uh, Paco is just a little too Voltron for me. I'm playing niv at Payroom right now, which you can argue is kind of Voltron-y because the deck, the deck spins wheels off of him. But... Um, I definitely don't like the type that I'm just going to play this card and attack you a bunch, and if he gets removed, I'm going to wait to play him again, and that's it. So, uh, Niv Mizzet is definitely a little bit more interactive, a little bit more toolboxy. Okay, very cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey, Jimmy, what are you up to? Oh, learning how to make a YouTube channel. Uh, you have a YouTube channel. This is a YouTube channel. We are literally on YouTube right now. Oh. Well, not for podcast listeners, but that's beside the point. I'm learning how to make this channel better thanks to this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online community with thousands of classes for all sorts of creative pursuits. It's perfect for anyone who's trying to pick up a new skill or develop an existing interest like I'm doing now. We are always trying to improve our productions. Exactly. That's why I've been watching YouTube Success, Script, Shoot, and Edit with MKBHD, taught by Marcus Brownlee. He's given me some great insight into planning out shots and strong visuals to keep viewers engaged in our content. Plus, Skillshare has classes for all experience levels, from beginner to pro, so there's always something new to learn. And Skillshare is curated specifically for learning. That means no ads or distractions, just loads of premium classes to guide you down whichever path of creativity excites you the most. With Skillshare, you get more than just an online membership. It's access to a whole community of encouragement, communication, and inspiration. The first 1,000 Command Zone listeners to click the link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Oh, sweet. There's a class on making sourdough bread? I gotta take that one. Oh, no, that's a good one. Hey, is that sourdough? Did you take that class already? Bye -bye. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Check out betterhelp.com slash command zone. Oh, hello. It's me, Karazakar, the eye tyrant. I never wanted to be an eye tyrant, though. I always wanted to be an eye nice guy. But when I get anxious, I used to lash out like, Attack, you worthless minions! Attack! <laughs> but after getting in touch with BetterHelp, I've been working through my anxiety to become the beholder I want to be. And you know what? Now I feel like a brand new eye. In fact... Hey, minions! Great work today! You're awesome! Hooray! BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Unload the stressors and get some unbiased feedback. You'd be pretty surprised at what you might gain from it. See if it's for you. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Command Zone listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Command Zone. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Command Zone. So first, I'll play Spore Frog. Uh, do you want to pay the one for Ristic Study? No way, man. Paying the one is lame. What? No, no, no. You always pay the one. Sounds bogus to me. Yeah. Ugh, man, no one ever listens to me. Hold on. I have my blender shades. This might be a job for... Cool, cool Jimmy. Jimmy! Sup, I just dropped by because I heard some uncool cats weren't paying the one for Ristic Study, even though it's the rad thing to do. No, I'm, I'm cool, man. I'll pay the one. Sounds great to me, and I'm the one not even getting to draw. You're the best, Cool Jimmy. Bring out your cool factor with Blender's Eyewear. 
Blenders have an awesome look that rivals any big brand shades out there, but at the price you can actually afford. And the Blenders team is always brewing up new styles, from orange polarized wraparounds to classic gold arms on black lenses. But it's not just sunglasses. Blenders offers prescription glasses, readers, blue lights, and more. All right, I'm gonna cast Yagma. Uh, do you pay the one? <laughs> no, you can draw. What? what? To score 15% off your Blenders purchase, visit BlendersEyewear.com and enter promo code COMMANDVIP. That's BlendersEyewear.com, code COMMANDVIP for 15% off. Blenders, rocked with pride worldwide. All right, do you, uh, I'm here with Gaurav. Gaurav, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Gaurav Gulati, and I am a editor here. I've worked here since April of this year, 2021, and uh, m m mostly I work on the ads here. So if you've seen any of the ads, which I don't know if this is before the mid-roll or after, but we, I don't know. We currently do not know. <laughs> well, presumably, they've watched more than just this video of ours. Yes, yes. I've worked on the ads here and a few of the special projects we've done here, like some of the Strixhaven stuff and the AFR stuff that we did. Oh, yeah, the D&D, the tavern uh, video that Jimmy and I were, we were talking talking to the D&D characters. Yeah. As well as the Learn to Play video, which was one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. The, you've only been here since April? I know, right? It feels super weird. <laughs> you said 2021. I was like, that's not true. Yeah. But I guess it was true. Feels like you've been here for a long time. Time is wild now. Gaurav's just fit right in. Gaurav, what, uh, what kind of magic player would you say you are? So I would say I'm probably mostly a Johnny with bits of spikiness in there, but I love building a little engine that you can see little pieces go from top to bottom and hitting little slots. Um, yeah, so, you like building Rube Goldberg machines? Yes. Oh, yeah. I love watching and building those. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody else does that on the on the table, I'm just like super satisfied by that happening. You're like, this is cool. Yeah. I'm not doing it, but you are. Yeah. That's cool. I'm probably going to lose, but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about a deck that you built, but found out that you hated it. Yes. So a deck I built, and this is pretty early in my EDH career. This was like four or five years ago when I had my first play group and I was starting out on Commander. I built a Zedru the Great Hearted deck, which is a Jeskai deck that is uh, basically this card gives permanence to other players that usually don't help them. The way I built it is that some of them did help. So at the start, I was like, I'm helping everyone. But eventually they're like, wait, a lot of these don't help me as much as they're helping the person who's playing Zedra, which I get to draw a card and gain life based on how many permanents other people control. So you give them like howling minds maybe. And yeah. then, then you give them the ones that de like deal 20 damage to them or whatever. Right. So like one, one card that I use like Statecraft was basically prevents combat damage uh, from the person who has that. So I would give it to somebody and if they had an aggro deck, like they do nothing then basically unless they can get rid of the enchantment, which is hard for them to do most of the time because they're playing an aggro deck. Um, so oh, yeah, there's that other card that like you don't take damage, but you don't have no draw step. Kind yeah, of stuff, that kind of stuff. Stuff like that. So what made you want to build this uh, Zedru group hug deck? Uh, so uh, before that, I had basically just made pre-cons and kind of upgraded them. And I was looking online for other cards that were really weird. And someone had talked about this card and the potential it had to make a sort of group hug deck that is super political. And I had not made a political deck, one that makes deals and stuff. And like I said, it was very early in my career playing uh, commander, so I wanted to build something that was very different and uh, required me to like talk to other players and make deals. Turns out the playgroup I was with uh, didn't like politicians very much and figured out that they were scheming liars most of the time. <laughs> And uh, after a couple games, they were like, oh, I know what this deck does. I'm just going to kill you first most of the time. I'm not going to talk back to you. I'm just going to kill you. Yeah. So it, it just didn't work out the way I wanted it to. And I think if I rebuilt it, it might be very different now because now I have a play group that I think would appreciate that. That's our play group, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like, it, I think that's the thing is like it, this deck wasn't great for that play group and probably wasn't super optimized either. But at the same time, like depending on the play group I would play with, maybe they would like it more. Maybe it would work out well. Mm. So it was the type of deck that needed certain kind of opponents or a certain kind of yeah. culture among your play group for it to really work. Yeah, it also like it, it also did kind of make games a bit longer than people liked, which I didn't know at the time was a bad thing. Then. Right. I know now like going a, a game going three hours like isn't everybody's cup of tea and not even mine at this point. Like right. I'd rather get more games than longer games. Interesting, interesting. So what happened to the deck? Is it still put together or is it? Uh, it is still put together for the most part. I've taken powerful cards out of it because I had like land tax and some other cards that were like really, really good. So I just put them on other decks. But it, I, it for, I think it's like 80% still there. So I can still maybe bring it back at some point. So like it's sitting there sort of half disassembled in the in the corner somewhere? Yeah, I have it in a box. It's labeled. It's I guess still a lot of those Zedru cards are just not useful anywhere else. So it's not like... Yes. Out. Yeah, a lot of them just don't apply for other decks. It's a very specific kind of deck. So they're going to be in there unless I... 
find a different deck. I don't think anything else works with it, though. Yeah. So do you think you'll put it back together? I think I will. Now that I've, I've looked, I was, Josh asked me, like, hey, talk about decks that, you, that don't work. So I started looking into this, and a lot of cards have come out that make this deck way more fun and weird and do strange things. So I'm kind of, I, I kind of do want to rebuild it now. Uh, I don't know if we did the right thing here. We might have <laughs> yeah. talked him into rebuilding the deck that he doesn't like. <laughs> It's going to be great. I'm very happy. Maybe an extra turns or something. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. All right. We are joined now by Damon. Damon, you're brand new here at the Command Zone, so why don't you introduce yourself and tell everyone what you do. Of course. So my name is Damon Lenz. I'm a junior editor here at the Command Zone. I just started here about two weeks ago. Wow from the time of this recording. So, uh, you know, really excited to, to work here. And I've been a fan of your guys' content since basically the beginning. Oh, wow. Uh, really? Yeah, I remember just looking at the when you guys just had generic ma- uh, magic art up yeah. on the screen. <laughs> and I remember, like, the first time I saw your guys' faces, like, I, I knew you from yeah. VGHS, uh-huh. but uh, seeing Josh for the first time, that was that was really interesting. So That's fun. Yeah, yeah. I remember that when we decided, like, we're going to do video now, and we're like, are we video people? I'm like, I guess we are. Because Josh had always worked behind the camera as well. That's right. Uh, sure. So, Damon, how would you describe yourself as a Magic player? What are your favorite colors? What's your favorite style? All that. Got it. All right. So, my favorite color by far is blue. Nice. Uh, I'm definitely a control player at heart, uh, but I'm the kind of guy where it's like, I'll figure out how to win later on. As long as I'm drawing cards, then I'm having a great time. Uh, when I'm not playing control, though, I, I lean very he- uh, heavily into tribal decks. Oh, um, cool. So. What's your favorite tribe, if you had to name one? My favorite tribe is definitely vampires. I started playing nice. uh, Magic in original Innistrad and just fell in love with the the way that they designed the vampires uh yeah entirely other than that probably werewolves so. i do love vampires as well so wow you just love innistrad then i do i'm a huge fan of innistrad it's a good uh, time for you to be a magic player right now exactly <laughs> yep okay so what is a deck that you built but now hate don't have or dislike got it um well, for me, I'd have to say it's my Mariki Ru Barrett deck. Uh, I built it yeah. many, many years ago. Uh, I, I love the idea of it. You know, I leaned really heavily into the control aspect, mm-hmm. running some of my favorite cards like Sphinx's Revelation and, uh, and the like. Stealing um, other people's stuff. Exa- that was the control element. Exactly. So the whole point was I didn't built any win conditions into the deck. I would rely <laughs> on stealing my opponent's stuff to win the game. You know, I just figured I'd, I'd figure it out with their tools, right. and it was kind of like a puzzle I was figuring out. Right. And for, that ties into your I'll draw enough cards and win eventually sort of whole thing, right? Exactly. And, you know, for a little bit, it was really cool, and the issue that I kind of ran into is very quickly, you know, people don't like getting their stuff stolen, so, True. Uh, you know, my playgroup would end up targeting me first, and so I'd end up not doing a whole lot, and it'd be really sad, so <laughs> I didn't up taking it apart you know what i was like you know what i'll take one for the team and i'll just i'll just play something else so. now was it the only deck that you had at the time or did you have a lot of other things to choose from just when that deck came out people were like kill him first uh, it was not my first deck uh i'd been playing commander for a long time before that uh okay. but you know it was it was still sad because i invested all that time and, and that money in, yeah. into it yeah. and every now and again i think about going back to it but like then i i remember like i don't know if i'm ready to be that guy again you know <laughs> but the deck was functional right it, it worked and it's not like it was janky or had too many high cmc cards and all that stuff right oh no it worked great yeah uh, it when i wasn't targeted immediately the deck functioned how the deck was supposed to function you know i had the right amount of card draw right amount of ramp all that stuff everything you'd possibly you know need but it was just one of those things where when it was functioning optimally other people didn't like it so impressive yeah Yeah. did you play it at game stores as well or did you find this mostly like in your own personal meta it was mostly my own personal meta uh me and my friends play at a at a game store Mm -hmm. so we would occasionally play with randoms and then during those games it was a bit less of an issue but anytime i was playing with my friends they they knew what the deck was about so they're like nah we're not we're not having it now were your other friends decks did they any of them veer into that control range or were you kind of like that type of player at the table and the only one there doing that one of my other very close friends also enjoys control. I think I kind of pushed him in that direction. I'm right. like, hey, look at all this cool stuff. I'm doing. <laughs> um, but like a good I, blue player. <laughs> exactly. But I am definitely the one that was like leading the charge when it comes to being the control player. Like uh, I, I always play the decks where it's like, I will handle the threats on the board. I like being the answers guy, if that makes sense. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. I think threat assessment is like one of those things that really is challenging. Uh, And being the control player, that's kind of the job you assign yourself to, right? Exactly. Yeah. And and, and I like being that. You know, it's it's kind of an unfortunate thing when I'm playing like certain decks, certain aggressive decks where it's like somebody does something and I 
and I feel it in my gut and I'm like, I can't do anything about that. And it, it physically hurts me. Oh, but it's wow. like when I'm playing my favorite decks, my control decks, I'm like, I can relax. I know I can answer yeah, that and yeah, that yeah. and that. And I'm having a good day. You know? I think that's that's why you're a good editor too then, right? You're kind of lining up your options and knowing how to attack a problem from Exactly, exactly. Like I, nice. I like figuring out solutions to the problems I'm having and I like answering those problems, you know. Good to know. Well, that's great. You're one of the few people that had a functional deck and it worked, but the play group and sort of the effect it caused is what made you disassemble it. Yeah, exactly. My little sister still gives me uh, grief over it to this day. <laughs> She's like, oh yeah, I remember your Mariki deck and like, I'm like, yeah, I know. Amazing. Wow, it's become a part of your personality. Exactly. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, that's awesome. Thanks so much for sharing, Damon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Peace. All right, okay, and suddenly I have changed clothes because we are recording this on a different day, but we're here with Truck. Truck, do you want to introduce yourself to our fans out there? Yeah, so I'm Truck. I am uh, pretty new here. I started around a month, month and a half ago. I am uh, Josh's assistant, so I mostly uh, just help around where I can, provide snacks, moral support, you know, all the good stuff. He's in charge of all the scheduling and make sure we don't forget things around here. Um, yeah, snacks, very important job. Thank you, Truck. Uh, our snack game has been up since you got here, so I got to say, because I used to take care of it, and I'm way less, um, uh, I have a less imagination for snacks than you do. Oh, yeah, so. I take I take a lot of pride in the snacks. <laughs> I know the, the team is appreciative. Uh, okay, what kind of magic player are you? Uh, I would say I like doing really cool stuff, mm -hmm. um, but I like doing it really weird ways. So basically, if you can do a combo in two or three cards with six mana, I will look for a way to do it in f with 15 mana and like seven cards. <laughs> okay, so just strictly worse, but you're trying to do it, uh, s pull off similar things, but in more unique ways, how about yes, that? Yes, yes, I wanna do something that you, you may have likely seen before, like make tokens, make mana, but I wanna do it in interesting ways with cards that you may have not seen before. Okay, so let's talk about a deck that you built but ended up hating. Yeah, so uh, pretty early on when I got into Commander, I built a Lathral deck. She's Elf Tribal, you know, pretty standard. Um, and for anyone who's ever built a Tribal deck before, especially Elves, uh, it kind of builds itself, kind of. Um, so you just play Mana Dorks, you ramp, um, you get a bunch of Elves. Your Elves make more Elves, your Elves buff Elves, and then you just hit people in the face and then you win. Um, and Sounds, but but it isn't tried and true strategy. It is powerful. It is very powerful, no doubt. Um, I got a lot of good wins with the deck, but my problem with it was always after a game or two, it just it felt like I was playing the exact same game plan every time. And if I'm being completely honest with myself, I I'm kind of a hipster, so <laughs> it it feels really boring to just be like, okay, guys, for the fourth game in a row, I have. 10 one, one elf tokens and I play Crater Hoof Behemoth and I win. Okay. I mean, I get that. So it had sort of a linear play style or it felt like the uh, each game was not different than the last game. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say something like that. Um, I also like just like, again, I like doing cool things. I like uh, kind of like being contrarian or things like that. So uh, my, my currently my favorite deck is uh, Obeka. Uh -huh. um, and I re really just love the deck. Because like, Obeka's not like any other deck. Exactly, exactly. You get to do so many cool things with the stack and ending turns. And like, I just, I love like putting them on my imaginary glass and like, maintaining priority. <laughs> I end my turn. <laughs> so what happened with your Lathral deck? Is it still together or did you take it apart all the way? No, it's, it's basically all gone now. Like all the elves are still there because I don't, you know, elves aren't as useful in other decks. But uh, I pulled out the good mana dorks for my other green decks. Use the mana um, base in another way. Yeah, the I, good lands. Yeah, and then um, all the good artifacts I pulled out for other decks. You know, I had uh, boots in there. So you couldn't pick it up and play it tomorrow. It's just it's gone. Oh no, I'd have to. It it would take me a long time to put it back together. You truly hated the deck. Yeah, I mean, I don't hate and like I love Magic. I don't hate any deck, but like if you made me play it, I wouldn't be too happy about it. All right, now I am here with. Manson. Manson, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Manson. I'm one of the Game Nights editors here at the Command Zone. And yeah. How long have you worked uh, here on the team, Manson? I started here 2020, January 2020, right at the new year. So it's almost two years now. Just yeah. under in yeah, January. Kind of crazy. Years. Yeah. Kind of crazy. Yeah. Manson, prim I mean, you're almost exclusively are editing on game nights these days, right? Yeah. I used to work on the podcast for a while, but now transitioned over to game nights. And that's that's his day all the time. So uh, 
in the comments, make sure to throw Manson a thank you because I know a lot of people like the show. Okay, Manson, w- how would you describe yourself as a magic player? Um, I think I'm more, well, I like to be more of a control player, mm. but obviously that's not, you know, something that the table really likes. <laughs> people don't tend to give you a lot of love for being a control player? Yeah, not really. <laughs> so does that mean you've changed? Like you don't play control that much or what? Yeah, not really. I play a little more, I guess, battle cruiser now where mm-hmm. I just have my own board and then do my own stuff while not really interacting too much with anyone else's things. It's interesting. I'm sure some people have seen Manson on our content. You've been on Extra Turns. Uh, the Zada deck was one people liked a lot, or yep. the um, the Polymorph deck. Yeah, I yeah. Our Polymorph. So yeah. definitely some cool stuff. Okay, let's get to the subject at hand here. What is a deck you once built and found out you hated? So this deck was my Marchesa the Black Rose deck. So OG Marchesa. Yep. Um, this was actually one of the first decks I've ever built for oh. Commander, actually. This was like when, when you were I, new to the format? Yeah, brand new to the format. This was like the first deck I built. And it was all about... And it's the deck you found out you hated? Yeah. That's hard. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one well, of the decks. That's not a deck I would think of. Uh, you know, some of these people are going to talk about or have talked about where you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Marchesa just off the top doesn't make me think of like not... Like Jimmy's favorite deck is his Marchesa right. deck. So yeah, what, 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 well, how'd you build it first of all? Well, first I built it where... I would be stealing everyone's creatures basically with like threatened effects like act of treason or uh, whatnot. So yeah, I, if you don't know Marchesa, the way it reads is um, re- if it has a plus one plus one counter when it dies, a creature you control, it comes back to the battlefield under your control, not under owner's control. So if you can threaten effect somebody's creature, sack it. It was under your control when it died. It'll come back to your control as long as it had a plus one plus one counter. Yep. So you were using threaten effects to just steal people's stuff forever. Right. So I, I give it a plus one plus one counter with like the dethrone because Marchesa gives everyone dethrone. So that was pretty easy. And then I just steal it. Yeah, basically forever. That sounds fun. It was fun for me anyways. <laughs> <laughs> just stealing everyone's commander, everyone's creatures. Was, uh, it was a great time for me, but... <laughs> Turns out I found out that everyone doesn't really like their, you know, creatures stolen. So is that why you found out you dislike playing it? Yes, exactly. Because every I saw everyone else's faces at the table. They were just like, oh man, this again. You know? <laughs> they didn't like it. Not at all. So you were receptive to your playgroup. Did they come to you specifically and say it or you just got the vibe playing it? How, like how many times did you play it before you kind of decided you weren't going to anymore? Uh, So this was like... So this was like pretty much my only deck for a while because I was still brand new, right? So me, me and my play group be playing for a while and I figured out that, you know, once we played, you know, a couple games, everyone's like, well, here we go again. And you can see, read their body language. They're just slouching like back on their phones. Like, all right, well, he's going to do the Marchesa thing again and steal our creatures. So what did you do with the deck? So I actually toned down a lot of the threatened effects for the deck. I still kept a couple because I do enjoy playing with other people's cards. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now it's more of a reanimation deck. Where so, so you still have the deck, but you just sort of uh, pivoted away from its original theme? Yes, exactly. Although I don't bring it out much because I found out that Marchesa is still not too fun to play against because it's just so hard to get rid of if it gets a counter. Yeah, but that's that feels like every deck now is hard to get rid of. Yeah, that's kind of true too. <laughs> Uh, Okay, that's awesome. Um, So the deck still exists. Uh, I think a lot of people we've talked to, like that deck is just gone and they don't play it anymore. But you managed to like pivot out of it and just be like, okay, I still... How many commander decks do you have now though? Uh, Maybe like 12 or something. So a lot. Yeah, I haven't kept count too much, but there's just 12. I only rotate around like five or six that I like enjoy playing. And is Marchese in the five or six or is it outside of that? No, it's definitely more outside of that because yeah, people still don't like playing against that card. Maybe it's just the memory of what happened originally. Maybe it was. (laughs) All right. So great to hear from everyone at the office. We really hope that you enjoyed meeting some of them for the first time as well. And, you know, for being first time on camera for some of them, they all did great. I'm they so all happy. did awesome. All our people are so photogenic and charismatic. It's yeah. awesome. We're going to be out of a job soon, Jimmy. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, if we're being replaced by them. Okay. <laughs> So I think it would be interesting before we kind of wrap this up and talk about our takeaways mm-hmm. uh, for you and I to really quickly talk about a deck or two we yeah. have that fits uh, that fits the discussion here. Definitely. So do you have any decks, Jimmy, that you built and then discovered that you hated? The first deck that I built but I really don't like was a Super Friends deck with Child of Alara at the helm, a five-color deck. <laughs> but that sounds like a really good idea. Uh, yeah, it's not because it blows up everything when Child of Alara goes away and there weren't that many five-color options at the time. So I was like... 
this one sounds fun because I'm only going to have planeswalkers. Turns out it's not that fun when everyone just gets wiped the moment it dies. And it, yeah. So this is why it didn't work. But I, I love the idea of Super Friends. This was like three or four years ago uh, before Oath of the Gatewatch had come out. So I was like, you know what? I think that di- the, inter- the interaction between doubling season and Super Friends is so cool. You can instantly ultimate your planeswalkers. And I just went directly into that idea specifically. I only put in planeswalkers that could double ultimate immediately with doubling season. And I only built ways to get the doubling season out. And yeah, all that. the tutors, all that. Yeah. And it was just so boring because one, every single person knew what you were trying to do. <laughs> and it, it played out the exact same way or it just completely fell on its face. And I had no creatures and everyone just attacked me and I died. So it was like a good idea because I wanted to build a planeswalker deck, a super friend deck, but I just didn't have the right sort of like way to make it fun. I just made it very much like by the book. It was almost like a black and white deck, if that makes sense. Like it was just very clear cut. What are you trying to do? How are you trying to do it? Are you going to execute on your plan? Yes or no? If not, you lose. If so, you win. So that wasn't very exciting to me. Um, and I, it, it, the deck is still together, but I'm I'm waiting to retool it into a more fun, interactive Planeswalker deck. Jimmy doesn't really ever tech decks apart. He's got some decks in his in his <laughs> so old. thing that are like, yeah, I've like, I haven't seen that deck in like five years. Yeah. And <laughs> has there are dual lands in it. Yeah. And there are no two mana rock in it either yeah very old build style uh, and then another deck that i actually played on game nights that everyone saw it was a very early game nights again that's the theme here it was in the heb the worthy and it was the first time i really built like a tribal deck i was like i want to make minotaur tribal work but the problem is i didn't really think about the balance in rakdos because you don't have access to a lot of the ramp and card draw and i was trying to keep flavorful as well as make it effective but i just didn't have that balance right the deck almost never plays well and it never comes together uh and so it just always falls flat in its face and i played rakdos a bunch of times on game night so i've just kind of tried to learn the lesson over time but this was like my first real try at it and boy it sucked and i hate playing it and it's just not fun because minotaur is overall not very powerful so you hate playing it because it's just not good the it's idea didn't come not together. good the the tribe isn't even that interesting we didn't have all the changelings from like Kaldheim and stuff to make it more impactful and all that and in black red tribal just it doesn't feel great unless you're playing like vampires or something the other mono red Neheb is more your speed? Yeah, the one where I try and kill everyone by turn three. Yeah, that one for sure. <laughs> um, how about you, Josh? Decks you built, but you don't like anymore? Yeah, I have two I'm going to talk about as well, although there's been many. Um, yeah. <laughs> I built, I built, and we both built this deck. I built a Mizzix deck, mm-hmm. and it was uh, an sort of ex-tribal Mizzix deck. And famously, I think early in early days of this podcast, I would talk about how I just never lost with that deck. And I think yeah. I went like the first like 12 or 15 games with it, just never having lost. Um, but it was built around X counter spells, you know, counter spells that make you pay X uh, or more. Yeah. Because, you know, eventually you're paying only one for those and Mizzix is filling in the X as like 12, 20. Do you, can you pay, <laughs> can you pay 37 more? Um, which I thought was cool. But then I realized what I think a lot of our, our team members realized, which is that people just didn't like playing against. It was just too mean. It was yeah. just too much of a permission deck. It could get to the point where it could just counter everything for the entire table. Oh, I see. Yeah. And that's exactly. just kind of oppressive. And so, yep. Yeah, I eventually did take the deck apart uh, because it had things like Force of Wills and, you know... Yeah, blue and red, very powerful cards. Yeah. Yes, powerful and expensive cards. I don't have, you know, I think I only have three Force of Wills. So it's yeah. like if one is stranded in a deck I never play, that, that's not something I want. Uh, and then the second deck is a deck I've also talked about on the show a decent amount. <laughs> it's this called, one's a thing yeah, of legends, dude. <laughs> it's the Stop Hitting Yourself deck. It was kind of built around Boris Reckoner and some other cards that are basically like, if I have these cards that stuffy when doll. they... Yeah, Stuffy yeah. Doll. That when they take damage, uh, Brash Taunter's a new one. Yeah. Um, when they take damage, it'll do stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, And then, so I wanted to build a deck that was like, the entire point of the deck was to deal damage to my own creatures or own stuff to some effect. And, and have that affect the table. And yeah. Yeah, that's the theme you were building around. Yeah. And it, it just doesn't work. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, it didn't like four or five years ago and i think this is the insidious thing about these deck ideas that like are kind of flawed concepts are not yeah. supported is <laughs> like every time a brash taunter comes out i'm like maybe that'll make the stop hitting yourself deck work and it's like no josh about 15 cards Need have to. to come out before <laughs> it'll work right because <laughs> i know i've been talking about like the ooh the the forced fighting deck for so long right. it's like still not quite there yeah to have a commander deck that you know that's a wild concept uh work 
it has to be supported enough. You have to have a high um, a high density of the key cards, and yeah. that's yeah. just a really hard bar to clear, especially as the format keeps getting faster. Like the stop hitting yourself deck is worse probably now than it ever was because now you can't even play three mana rocks as much, right? Like yeah. it's just the format sped up because more cards have come out, and I don't know how. It, there's no way it functions in a world where Jessica's wills and underworld breaches and smothering tithes exist. You know? Yeah, and you're sitting there trying to make your little Rube Goldberg machine. Yeah, and you're like, hey, everyone, look how cool that I'm dead. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> oh, maybe on shoot. turn twelve, I could do something, but the yeah. game just won't, won't get there. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of things that I think have to go into that deck to make it work. And the more you start putting it in, the worse it just gets because yep. those are slots that should be with better cards or whatever. Yep. So okay. So pretty interesting to hear from everybody here and mm -hmm. i've made a little list on my phone of oh, yeah, whatever just so we can refer to it here what everybody said to so many people um so takeaways i think you know one thing from listening to everybody talk about their decks is we can kind of sort there's really only like four or five categories of decks yeah like every a lot of people had similar reasons for disliking decks right? yeah it always sort of boils down to a few of the same key elements right yeah so the first one i think is the most obvious which is you know, my Mizzix deck, mm -hmm. um, I think... Uh, uh, Damon's Miriki deck. Da Damon talked about this. Shauna, which I found was interesting because she's a CEDH player. And yeah. she had, I didn't realize that this was actually still a thing in CEDH, which is a deck that's just too mean, quote unquote. Something that your opponents don't like playing against. Yeah. Uh, we've, we heard from a couple people that just like stealing everybody's stuff um, tends to be something that people don't like. Uh Manson was another person mm -hmm. that said that, like, hey, I was playing Marchessa, stealing everybody's stuff, and my playgroup hated it. It's interesting because nobody said I was playing a land destruction deck and everybody hated that. Right. Nobody said I'm playing a stacks deck. But stealing just tends to... People hate that more than almost than just like comboing out or destroying their stuff, right? Yeah, and Dame was talking about control specifically. So he was like the Mizzix deck where he was always permissioning. He was doing the thing where, you know, he loves threat assessment and he's the one deciding, is that going to resolve or not? And for him too, he didn't play as much outside of his regular play group. So over time, that same deck is just going to feel more and more oppressive and just like, oh, that again. And so I can totally understand why that might make you start to not like it either. Arthur mentioned an interesting thing when we were, when I was talking to him about his elves deck and how he didn't like it because he saw the path it was going towards and mm. it was really like CEDH. It was going towards too powerful, uh, which yeah. I think is kind of the cousin to too mean. Um, you know, some groups want to be more powerful than others, but if you don't want to be in CEDH territory with your deck, then, you know, too powerful almost is similar to being too mean, if that makes sense. I yeah, think. it's tough with elves, too, because the more you put elves in, the more you go into those legacy combo decks that are all trying to win the same way. And then after a while, it's like, can you actually build certain tribes without eventually devolving into that? Mm, interesting. Yeah. I'd say the one that people said the most out of all of these is like this... this I, the idea for my deck was inherently flawed. Yeah. yeah so that's yeah. kind of your Neheb deck. Mm -hmm. um, I think Jamie talked about it with Growth Growthama. Thama. Yeah. Too Mimi. Too many ideas didn't, yeah. didn't work out. But there's this this thing where like, oh, this is my Stop Hitting Yourself deck as well. Oh, yeah. Murph talked about uh, Asmara and a deck that he just couldn't get to work even though he was tr he tried many times. You know, he said he tried a couple of months to like optimize it and just could never get it to a point where it really felt like it, it could actually tangle with real decks. It's kind of like that design theory. Like it's either bottom up or top down. And when you start with the idea and build from that it's actually sometimes just not possible you right. don't have the tools at your assistance yeah that's that's interesting so it's just inherently not going to work um you know everybody has cool ideas and then you get into an actual game of magic a real game and you realize oh this just will not function because the way yeah. that games play out my opponents never let this happen or they never i never have this opportunity that in theory i thought i had yeah uh, it's I interesting with jamie's grathama deck too because it wasn't like i'm gonna make it less you know i have 20 ideas in here let's take it down to two and make it more it's just like you know what i'm just not even gonna bother i'm gonna yeah. do something else entirely which i thought was interesting yeah if i can't do the cool thing well i don't really want to do this deck yeah. right yeah i sure i could turn it into like a big monsters deck but that's not really what i set out to do right right i, I think this one is not so much a problem right i think too mm -hmm. mean or whatever but though I, I like having ideas trying them out and, and it's okay if some of them work and some of them don't and i just keep the ones that do i think that's kind of like it's like kind of the creative process yeah it's less that you hate your deck at that point you're more kind of disappointed that your thing your, didn't come to fruition it's like the dad i'm not mad at you but i'm just, <laughs> just disappointed, disappointed. your deck's like whoa <laughs> no <why> <laughs> <laughs> uh there were some interesting answers i found um jordan and ashland's particularly yes. interesting I thought that was really interesting too yeah because they didn't they kind of hated decks for reasons of like, this doesn't match my personality or what I like about playing the game. Yeah, and that's so important when you sit down. These decks are all supposed to be personal expressions of who you are as gamers. And for Ashland, it was like, this deck works. It functions. It wins games. Powerful, yeah. It's powerful, 
but it's just too much mental work. And I, you know, after two or three games of a commander night, sometimes you don't want to have that in your arsenal because it's like, do I want to sit here and have to sit and calculate till end of turn effects? And yeah, do I want to like have three? to have like a notepad where I can do the math? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I get that because I, I'm actually like Ashlyn, where those type of decks I literally steer clear of. Attracts a proliferate. Stuff. Yeah, so many counters and all that. Yeah, it's just like oh, this gets one, this gets two. Oh crap. Okay, so it doubles and then it doubles again, which is what? What is this? Then it's just like this is not why I want to be playing. Yeah, and also takes away from the other decisions that you want to be making that are important like for instance we just played a game with a coat of arms and it's like wait this oh affects the whole table and every time we went to combat it's like okay let's go over every single creature's power and toughness again this is not like online where the numbers are just written there or game nights yep. you have to calculate each time and then making mistakes and then oh, going back it's like oh headache yeah so and i think some people like that and that's totally fine yeah, they, totally. they would play the arbo deck or the plus one plus one counter deck it's just interesting that if you know yourself pretty well you kind of you won't know until you do it, but then you go through it and you're like, oh, I don't like this. Like, it's, yeah. I, I don't mind anybody else playing an Arrow deck with one-on-one counters as long as they're keeping track of their own stuff. That's totally fine. But I've definitely, like, not built the Corval deck because I've watched people do yeah. it, and I'm like... That's a lot of stuff. It's like this, I sack that, it triggers this, which triggers the thing over here, which happens, this, and then I draw a card, and then, you, and then you have to sack, and then it's just like, I don't want to do that. I just want to play two cards that let me draw seven cards. That's it. Yeah, you actually, it, when you said about, like, uh, in the last round table, you're like, I don't want to build my deck to beat you, I want to play my deck to beat you. Right. And sometimes when you have so many things that are happening, it's just like, it's a headache. You don't want to have to sit there and have to calculate and think of all of those elements I, I don't know time. if this happens to you, but I definitely think about it when we're building decks specifically for camera. Uh-huh. Which is like, I am likely to screw that up, which means I'm going to look yeah. really stupid <laughs> because I'm going to get some rules wrong and everyone's going to yell at me. So I will literally not play certain things because I'm like, listen, it, there's somewhere in that chain of events, yeah. I'm going to mess something up and I'm going to look dumb. So I'll just rather put in simpler cards so that it's just easier for me to not make a mistake. Yeah, you won't see Mizzix's Mastery in your decks anymore. <laughs> oh, man, that was the worst. And you won't see Garner the Blood Flame in my decks anymore either, as much as before, because it's true. You don't want to be like, oh, shoot. Uh, you, it's the worst on camera everyone's sweating we are in hour four of the game you're looking at your hand and going there's like a thousand options i just want to swing and attack yeah, exactly whatever i do I, i'm gonna be making the wrong decision i'm gonna yeah. get yelled at yeah you don't <laughs> know the great. pressure's running out there everybody yeah <laughs> um, uh Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the last one, the last takeaways I loved with Murph, especially because you call him a hipster. And it's true because sometimes we want to feel cool and do things with our deck. And sometimes if it doesn't pan out or if it's too much like, oh, this is just what everyone else is doing. You know, that is a way that we express ourselves to be like, you know, what? I'm not going to do that. I want to be unique. I want to do something interesting and cool. Yeah, I don't think any of our team members really underline this, but I have definitely, I don't know if you, you mm-hmm. were the same way, but I've definitely built decks or been in the process of building decks and just looked at it and been like, nah, this is just all the same stuff that a lot of decks run. And so it's not very interesting if every card is just kind of a staple. It's just kind of right. a good stuff deck. And it's like, no, I want to build, you know, that's why, that why I built the Dragon's Approach deck for the last episode. Right. I started to build that Gisa deck. And as I looked at it, it was just like a lot of black good stuff. And it was going to kill everybody's creatures and make or the game long. But blah, it, blah, yeah. yeah, but it's like, really? I'm going to play a deck that's just like Damnation, Toxic Deluge, Plague Crafter, like yeah, all, yeah, the, yeah. all the cards that everybody's seen a million times. That does just didn't sound fun to me yeah on the flip side of that jamie with his grothama deck saw that and went this is such a cool unique thing but then went too far into the cool uniqueness like, none of this is good too much of it and it just spread out apart yeah so there's an interesting balance there in the middle for sure then there's one other thing and again i don't think anybody here alluded to it but as we were talking about it um about this episode with everybody in the office one of the things we kind of underlined as a reason that people you know make a deck and then find out they don't like it is when it does the same thing all the time oh uh, yeah wins the same way or plays out the same way now again in cedh and a lot of people they don't mind that they're just trying to get the win and that's what they like and i think that's fine Mm -hmm. but i think a lot of people and and i don't know if you're like this but myself included is like i i like my deck to have some variability it's not trying to just tutor for the exact same piece and win in the same way every time right yeah i think for me specifically and maybe a lot of people actually it's more the games are about the journey not the destination right because even you know jamie said like i just want my play styles i want everyone to have fun and then hopefully I win at the end, right. you know, and that's sort of my attitude about it too. Cause I think we've all played now enough to get over the winning itch. Right. Sometimes I've you won want some games. I lose some games. Yeah. One more win or loss, you know, tonight or tomorrow isn't going to change my overall percentage at all. So yeah. big deal. And you'd yeah. much rather lose while having fun in the game than win while not doing something that you're enjoying either. I think. I think, you know, the, one of the most interesting things about this entire discussion though, is 
well, sort of two things is one is what sort of when you think about this, what you discover about yourself, what kind of player right. you are. We didn't say what kind of players we are. Jimmy, what kind of player do you think you are? Uh, I'm definitely, I like splashy. I like big, but I also like doing stuff that is just like, kind of like Craig style, I would call it. Cause Craig was one of the first people that brought me in the game, which is just like, check out this blam. Right. Oh snap. That, that moment. Timmy yeah. feeling of like, I did something and I want everybody to be like, wow. Yeah. I'm definitely not like a control player. I just, I don't like sitting and have to make so many individual decisions. I kind of like doing what's on my board and a occasionally dealing with things in the whole political aspect too i'm i'm a value player so of course i like to you know have a lot of options of things to do i don't like yeah. to ever feel like well i have to do this i didn't i can't make a choice because i only have this option in my hand so that's right. why i like drawing cards actually it's not just for the sake of card draw it's just feeling i think i have a feeling of being safe when i have a mm -hmm. lot of options at my command so i guess that is inherently a little bit controlly i do like to feel safe like oh i can I can affect things. I have, yeah. if this happens, I got this. And if this happens, I got that. And if this happens, I got that. And you can only do that if you have 27 cards in your hand. Yeah, and you're a real strategist too, I think, which is important because you're the one ultimately, like I get to make the decisions that determine if I'm going to win this game or not. Right. And I think Even though cool. that's not always true. Yeah, but true, true, true. You like to feel that way. Yeah, same with the politics, right? You like to be like, cool, I got to control this and sort of mess it, to mess it around to make it work for me. And if it didn't work out, then, you know, oh, maybe I can learn something from it, which I think is a big uh, element to your play style too. Um, so anyway, one of the interesting things about this entire sort of exercise was understanding, I think, as we talk to each person, like, well, but everybody doesn't like the things you like about the game. As you mm -hmm. talk to them, you're like, oh, you like different things about the game than I like. Yeah. And Garav likes different things about the game than either of us like. And, you know, Jake has his own certain way that he's, you know, makes him happy when he's playing. Yeah. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with the cards or the style, right? It's, everyone has a different thing that makes them like or not like things. It's not always a universal yeah, so I think keeping that in mind is actually really healthy and a really good way to understand when maybe things aren't going your way or people are playing mm -hmm. in a way. It's like, don't get mad at the person because they have a certain thing they enjoy about the game that they are trying to get to. And, and this also demonstrates that we're not always good at executing on that. Sometimes we do things that are straight up counter to what we like. And then right. it's in those moments that we discover that's not what we like. So again, give people a break maybe when they're doing something True. that you don't like because A, they, that might be what they like again about the game, but also B, that might be what they don't like about the game and they are <laughs> learning that in that moment. In that moment, yeah. yeah. I heard this really great quote, which was, uh, you know, like how you deal with problems that you have in your life. And in this case, games, it's like, well, first, write down all the problems you have, cross out the things you can't control, like what you're doing at the table or other people are doing, and just focus on the things you can do. Right. So there are moments where it's like, I'm not enjoying what's happening but maybe i can change a way that i play to actually find more fun in this moment and that helps you learn a lot more about yourself and what you're in control of and, and that ultimately i think leads better to better play experiences all right very cool i hope you enjoyed this episode it was fun to get to talk to all of our team yeah, members and get an insight on how they think about the game to the listeners what is a deck that you built at some point in time in your commander career and then found out that you hated it? Yeah, was it because of the any of the numbers, reasons that we listed it above? Is there someone in the, uh, the, the office that you like really, you're like, yeah, just like that. I'm just like that. Let us know in the comments. Yeah, if you didn't like a deck for a reason that's different than what we listed, we'd love to hear it as well. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, so post in the below. You can Twitter, all that stuff, email, good stuff. Yeah, if you want to uh, get a hold of any cards for a deck that you might be building that you haven't found out yet whether you like or hated it, <laughs> just go to Channel Fireball. <laughs> this is just a good endorsement. Go to yeah. channelfireball.com slash command or use promo code command. You know Channel Fireball, we talk about it a lot, has just started their new marketplace. Yeah. And I think the coolest thing right now that's happening is the marketplace is tied to a whole bunch of giveaways. Yep. Jimmy and I signed a bunch of Soul Ring promos. They might have given them all away by now. There was like 20, 25 of them, but maybe not. Anyway, mm -hmm. there are... Giveaways every single day mm -hmm. in the month of October. If you use the marketplace, you're entered to win for every $10 you spend. But really, the grand prize at the end are the big ones. Black Lotus. If you want to get that Black Lotus. Boom. Yeah. First edition over. Charizard if you're into that, too. Yeah. I mean, I would still take it even though I'm not a Pokemon. Yeah. Just because of the value. <laughs> I would go buy one $10 Pokemon card and be like, you know what? Let's roll the dice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so channelfireball.com slash command or use promo code command at checkout. And big thanks, as always, to Ultra Pro. They supply us with all the awesome game nights pieces that you see when we play. The playmats that are matching the sets. All of the most beautiful art in the world. I'm, I have a Jesper icing playmat in front of me. And, and Rossum, you one. know, we like Jesper so much that we were like, Jesper, we need you to make a playmat with us. So we can but, print it on an Ultra Pro playmat. 
like that. Yeah. yeah. So you can always get that art from the same artist from Ultra Pro because they are the ones that have that official license and they make all the best game pieces to protect your stuff, including that Black Lotus. You're going to win from Channel Fireball, right? Yeah. Put that thing in an Eclipse sleeve for sure. And whoever play wins it. it. Wait, don't. It's you know what? We, I just realized we cannot win the Black Lotus. <laughs> no, it would look yeah. really weird. No. Uh, I'm so sad I about feel bad. that. Well, every time that my we make a purchase, chance. we don't actually enter in the raffles. You know, so it'd be weird if I got my own signed soul ring in the van. <laughs> so it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. We're yeah. doing it for you, the people out there. Jimmy's so just we, going into all his decks signing his soul rings. <laughs> I'm like, hey, Josh, can Neheb, you sign my soul my ring? deck sign. <laughs> oh, maybe I'll like playing this deck now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. First, I was going to put down Squid Game, but then I realized like everybody already knows about it. Yeah, no one needs to. to well, I don't want to hear more about Squid Game. <laughs> it's the most talked about thing in the world right now. Um, but I was curious, Jimmy. Yeah. Have you seen it yet? I haven't. Okay, so me neither. Um, I was curious what your thoughts are leading up to the new movie release, which will be, I think, this week, this Friday, as you're okay. watching this, Dune. Specifically for the U.S., because it has actually come out across oh, true. the world. Yep. So I like to read reviews, and I try not to get hyped up. Uh, sorry, I, preliminary question. Have you read the books? I have read the book. Okay. Book, book, book. Not the books. Right. No, the first one. Oh, yeah. you're smart. Um, <laughs> some of the... Laziness. <laughs> uh, the first one's way better than the... Okay, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Ender's um, Game 2, same exact... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'd say the, the Dune sequels are better than the Ender's Game sequels. Sorry, sorry. All right. Not um, high bar. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Dune... So you've seen the... You've read the book. I've read the book. So I'm, you're a fan of the world. Yeah, I like the world a lot. Uh, it's one of the most iconic sci-fi franchises ever. However, I have avoided every adaptation of it. Uh, because I've you heard, never saw the other ones? No, because I've heard awful things about all of them. I mean, the 1984 movie is really bad, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 1984? And, I hope that's what I, it is. <laughs> oh, if it is, then you're a genius. That's <laughs> great. Um, so I haven't seen all that stuff, but I think the director is really good of, for this new adaptation. So Dennis Villeneuve, he did Blade Runner 2049. He did Arrival. Arrival. Uh, he, he has just amazing work, and he, he has that great cinema quality to all of his stuff. I love Oscar Isaac, Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya. The cast looks really good. Jason Momoa, right? So I have... Typically, I try not to have high expectations, but I got pretty high expectations for this movie. Uh-oh. <laughs> not uh-oh because I think it's going to be bad, but it's just, it's so much safer to go in with like moderate or low expectations and be yeah. <laughs> and, and be blown away by it. Especially come... considering the history of the projects in the past. And you've read the book, so you know that like how hard it, like. Oh, yeah. Just thinking about the book, it's like, how, how do you even do it? Yeah, so much. There's so much that you can get. The reason I didn't like the Harry Potter movies is because the books were able to describe things in a way that the movies could never even come close to showing me and making me feel. So I think Dune has a lot of that too. But but you know, not to not to spoil you because I haven't read a lot of reviews, but I know that they've been generally positive. Generally favor though. Yeah, and I'm terrible. trying really hard not to get excited for that reason. No, <laughs> but it looks sweet. It does. Like it looks beautiful. And I guess you know, even though it's gonna be on HBO Max and stuff too, this is a movie that I would go out to try and safely see in the theater for sure i would prefer and i'm going to try to see it in the theater it feels like it's going to be big and loud i want to i want to feel yeah. that worm you know worm Ooh. sign I, yeah i want the my seat to be shaking when yeah. that thing comes out comes out yeah yeah totally. so hopefully we can make that happen fingers crossed now if we have some international viewers that have seen it don't spoil it for us in the comments but uh, know that we're jealous and uh we and just say whether you thought it was awesome or not there you go yeah, yeah. yeah. get our hopes up so that we can they can be dashed <laughs> <laughs> dang it like our we're not we sponsored by hbo max i have no. we i think we might have been for something in the past but currently we are not we just you know dune's fun to talk about i hope yeah. it's good i love the books or i love the book <laughs> um, it's a cool world. It is a cool world. And if you haven't read the book, I, that is something that we can reliably One recommend. of the greatest of all time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Frank. Okay. Big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. Boy, we have Who grown. you just met a lot of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's... <gasps> Arthur Meadowcroft, Lady Danger, Manson, Lund, Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, Alfred Destaka, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Walda, Garav Galati, and our newest team members. Welcome them to the team. Truck Ty, Jamie Block, Damon Lenz, Shauna Gills, and Evan Limberger. Evan actually starts on Monday, but at the time you're watching this, that will have been yesterday. We'll have to ask him what his decks that he built are that he hates as well. Maybe we'll just we'll just snip that into like a, a future episode that's not even about that. <laughs> Absolutely. And big thanks to Jeffrey Palmer. He does the living card animations that often leave us behind us on the set. But more importantly, start our show at youtube.com slash the command zone podcast. You can find them on Twitter at Living Cards MTG. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next time.
For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>